Presentation. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. I bring to you greetings from the Association of Spine Surgeons of India, all the spine surgeons in our place, and also the 6,000 and more members of AO Spine. Thank you again. Now, when we talk of neglected spinal condition, I think severe kyphotic deformities of spinal tuberculosis is a perfect uh, example. Although it's an ancient problem, there are more than 3 million patients with active spinal tuberculosis in the world today, and unfortunately, what starts off like this frequently ends up like this, and it's a big disaster. The reason is that we have to understand that most of the patients who have gross deformity or, or the result of childhood spinal tuberculosis. Because when you see here, adults do have an increase in deformity, but once the healing takes place, then there is no increase in deformity over the rest of the period. But however, for a child, even though the cure of the disease is achieved over here, there is a continuous increase in deformity in approximately 40% of the children through the entire period of the growth. This is a perfect example. This child has been cured of spinal tuberculosis and has a 40 degree kyphosis. But then 15 years later, ends up with a 115 degrees kyphosis, not because of the disease, but because of the growth modulation due to uh, the deformity. So in this 15 year old study we found, we followed 63 children for 15 years and we found one of the most important factors which leads to a gross collapse is the event of facet joints dislocating when there is an anterior collapse. Most of us when we look at radiographs like this, we look at the anterior column, we talk about how much the body is destroyed, etc. but we do not look at the facet joints. And when the facets dislocate, biomechanically, it means the death of a column because the anterior deficit is there because of disease attrition, and then the posterior column is gone functionally because of the facet dislocation. And then you have a situation where a gross buckling can happen. Buckling is defined as when there is a death of a column, of a slender column, due to a collapse of both the anterior and posterior. And you will find soon, over a period of years, the kyphosis becomes more than 140 degrees, and the entire spine is converted into two compensatory curves. A situation like this often arises. You will find that when you take a cross-section, a very weird appearance of a cross-section of two spine occurs over here with sometimes painful bursitis in between. And this is exactly what happens that constricts the heart and also causes respiratory problems. Now, two types of collapse occur over here. Either they are one over the other, or they can completely slip, and these two columns are entirely different. And this poses a big challenge when you do a surgical correction because the spinal cord and the intracostal nerves are completely displaced over each other. There is another important physiological aspect to it. Because of the horizontalization of these vertebra, you'll find that the normal center of gravity of forces are not going through these, and these vertebra grow much longer than normal. You will find that in these people, the vertebras are almost like that of the quadruped animals where they are much longer. And this increases the parabola over which the spinal cord has to go, and we found that if the parabola is lengthened by 1.9 centimeters, the spinal cord is stretched by 3.8. And that is exactly the reason that these patients who have spinal tuberculosis or a gross deformity early in their life, but cured, but then end up with a stretch of the spinal cord and get a late neurological deficit many years later. So we have to be sure that we never ever discharge a patient with kyphosis after the cure of the disease, but carefully look after them over the period of entire growth. So with any evidence of increase in deformity, we have to be quick to do a spinal fusion. So the key is to identify the facet dislocation, and that is why we described these four simple radiological uh, signs. Dislocation of the facet 
retropulsion of the disease fragments, lateral translation and toppling over as signs to identify facet dislocation. And even in cured disease, if you find these signs appearing, then it means that you need to have a surgical fusion then actually. Now this is a good uh, case. You can see that there is all the signs are positive. The child is cured of the disease, running very well but we have to convince the parents to have a surgery done as otherwise this child will come up with a big problem. So what is the, that is prevention. So what are the surgical principles that have evolved in cure of these massive deformities? Now, we were always taught when we were training that the best way to cure spinal tuberculosis is through anterior approach because the dictum was that spinal tuberculosis is an anterior pathology and so must be approached anteriorly. But this was actually the cause for a lot of mortality and morbidity. Now if you look at this child, this child is already in respiratory distress. There is a lot of cardiorespiratory embarrassment. And to do a massive anterior thoracotomy in this child will actually mean a high risk for mortality or at least many days in ITU. So it would be best, much better if all of these can be done posteriorly. The possibility and development of surgical approaches by which anterior reconstruction can be done by doing a double costal transversectomy approach and the ability to reconstruct the spinal column with the use of titanium pedicle screws has led us to a wide paradigm of shift of approach where we now consider in kyphotic deformity correction the front door to the spine is actually through the back. So we can avoid this problem of having to distract the anterior column and correct the deformity. In spinal tuberculosis and in many other cases also there is a contracture of the spinal cord and when you do an anterior distraction you can end up with a problem of neurological deficit. So what would be the recent things is to do posterior closing procedures. Now it is much better that you approach the anterior column through the double constal transversectomy approach, remove this wedge of bone and close it so that you get good correction. Now this is absolutely possible and safe up to 60 to 70 degrees of kyphosis and this does well. But beyond that we get another problem. Here we also have to understand that in tuberculosis there are two differences. Now when we are talking of correction of deformities of ankylosing spondylitis and other pathologies, there is no disproportion of the anatomy of the anterior and posterior column. There is no structural loss. But here when you talk of kyphosis in spine, in TB, it is an angular kyphosis and you can find that T9 is actually very close to L2. That means this small fusion mass has almost four vertebra hidden into it and the posterior column is intact. So when you are correcting, there is a huge disproportion between the anterior wedge that you are taking. A small wedge that you take anteriorly actually represents uh, four vertebra and you need to do an extensive laminectomy on the posterior side which will allow you to do it and also not hinge and press on your spinal cord. This is very important. So if you are doing this in this buckling collapse, then if you just posteriorly close, you will find that the spinal cord also kinks or herniates through your posterior laminectomy defect. And we know from the work of uh, Dr. Kawahara that if you do an acute shortening of more than two centimeters of the spinal cord, the anterior spinal artery gets kinked and you can get a neurological deficit. So in these cases, what is required is not just a posterior closing. But you need to also open the anterior column adequately so that it's what is called the posterior closing and anterior opening osteotomies are required. COA, which is now very well performed and perfected uh, technique and it has dramatically improved the safety and efficacy of these procedures. So the incision and exposure is the same, a long uh, midline exposure. You need to do extensively uh, approach on the lateral sides. You do a double costotransversectomy approach and then you find that after you secure 
the uh, temporary rods and pedicles. You need to remove the, you can use a bar to create the triangular defect. What is very important and we learned from John Leong is that you should not start doing the osteotomy from the top, which means that you're always working close to the dura. You can puncture it, you can have a lot of bleeding. So always leave a big amount of bone at the top over here and do your entire wedge osteotomy, leaving the small thin wafer of bone as a biological uh, safety factor for the, this thing. Once you do that, you can see that there is a thin sheet of bone over here. You create a complete uh, wedge over here. And after that, you choose an appropriate length of the um, cage, which will go anterior. And uh, you then place the cage and use the cage as a fulcrum on which you would close posteriorly. And that you have to do slowly so that over a period of time you get a complete coverage. When you are doing this, as I mentioned before, you have to do extensive laminectomy posteriorly because of the anterior posterior column disruption. Otherwise, the upper and the lower lamina will wedge into the spinal cord and cause this problem. So over a slow period of correction, it is quite possible to get uh, excellent uh, results and it is a very safe uh, procedure. So some of the results over here on the table you can find over here. Now, one important surgical tip is that, that if you want to get very good results, then the distraction of the anterior column adequately is also important. This is the case we uh, can see in the child we have done it, but you can see that the anterior column uh, distraction is not adequate. And you will find that these patients do not get a good uh, correction. What needs to be done is that when you uh, open and do the osteotomy, if it is thoracic and up to thoracolumbar, leaving out L1, you always should not hesitate to uh, sacrifice two nerve roots on either side. And these nerve roots have to be tied and ligated at least one centimeter away from the dura so that you don't interfere with the blood supply over here. And then once you have an adequate exposure there, spend some time in getting the anterior column distracted as you close your posterior column. If your anterior column distraction is not adequate, then you get the scenario of what we did before. And if you can do that adequately, then this is the result that you can get. You can get a very good trip. Of course, spinal cord monitoring is required, and you need to do it in stages. This is not something that where you close the posterior side and anteriorly uh, as a quick uh, maneuver. You need to do it in stages, slowly, 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 remembering that you are doing something on the spinal cord of uh, some other person. And if you do that, you can get an adequate. So here's a video, but I will not go through it because of time, but the principles have been well covered. Thank you again for this opportunity.